All right, so chapter 53 um, is all about community. So a biological community, last chapter was about populations. A biological community is an assemblage of populations of various species living close enough for potential interaction. So, so you have a bunch of different populations living together, so different species living together um, is a community. So ecologists call relationships between species and the community interspecific interactions. And examples of those are competition between organisms, predation, where the predator hunts the prey, herbivory, which means that you have herbivores eating the plants, symbiosis, um, which is organisms living in close um, relationship with one another. We're going to look at parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism, and then this thing called facilitation. So we're going to look at all these. So all these different interactions are called interspecific interactions, and they can affect the survival and reproduction of each species. And the effects can either be positive, negative, or have no effect. So whenever you see the plus sign, that's a positive effect. Whenever you see the negative, it's a negative effect. And the zero means that it doesn't, it's not a positive or a negative. And so we can see here that this chart shows us um, the different types of interactions we're going to look at. So, so this is the interspecific um, interaction, and so there's competition, and that is negative-negative, meaning both organisms are negatively affected. So two more species compete for a resource that is in short supply. Predation, positive-negative, one species benefits, the other one um, is hurt. Um, herbivores, same thing, herbivory. An herbivore eats part of a plant or al alga, which is um, a sing singular for algae, which is plural. And um, so obviously the herbivore eating is positively affected and the plant is negatively affected. Then I wanted to point out that symbiosis um, is individuals... Uh, of two or more species that live in close contact with one another, and so that these three are examples. So symbiosis is here, and these three are one, two, three examples. So that's why they're indented here. And then facilitation. So there's one, two, three, four, five, and then these three are underneath here. And so we're going to look at, this is just a nice, neat little table here. I'm not going to read through all of this right now because we're going to look at each one of these specifically. So we're going to start out with competition. So interspecific competition is a negative-negative interaction. Occurs when species compete for a resource in short supply. And so this would be when it's near curing capacity where you need to um, uh, uh, get a resource. And it's negative-negative um, because both of them have to exp uh, expend time and energy um, to be able to compete to get that resource. And so they're both negatively affected versus if they did not have to compete to get the resource. So competitive exclusion, strong competition can lead to competitive exclusion. Local elimination of a competing species. So basically, if two species com are competing for the same resource, they can't coexist. And so one's going to be the winner and one's going to be the loser. And the loser is going to have to be go somewhere else. So the competitive exclusion principle states that the two species competing for the same limiting resources cannot coexist in the same place. So an example of this is this ecological niches and natural selection. So let's look at um, some of this. The sum of a species' use of biotic and abiotic resources is called the species' ecological niche. So it's how it uses all of its resources, both living and um, non-living, biotic and abiotic, the use of these resources. So it could be for food, it could be to build a nest, it could be to live in. Uh, an ecological niche can also be thought of as an organism's ecological role, the role it plays in the community in which it lives. So ecologically similar species can coexist in a community if there are one or more significant differences in their niches. And so they don't use and um, all the resources identically. 
So an example of this is resource partici partitioning. It's the differentiation of ecological niches enabling similar species to coexist in a community because they have differentiation, they use their niches differently. So an example of this is these different um, lizards. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species of lizards. And these different species, where their name, their scientific name is written, is where they occupy, where they perch. Um, so one perches um, on the fence post, one perches in different parts of the tree, um, and so therefore different ones on the branch, ones on um, the leaves, and things like that. And so they have different areas in the environment. So even though that they eat the same types of insects and so on, because they occupy different niches or perch in different areas, they are not really competing because this one is eating the insects in that area and this one's eating the insects in this area. And so they can coexist within the same space by occupying slightly different ecological niches. So the species fundamental niche is the niche potentially occupied by that species. So it's a niche where they could live. Like if we, re if we took all these other lizards out, this lizard could live up in the tree, but it doesn't because of the resource partitioning. A species realized niche is the niche it actually occupies. So oftentimes the realized niche um, uh, could be bigger if other organisms weren't there, but it's actually not because it's sharing that space with other organisms. As a result of competition, a species' fundamental niche may differ, its potential niche, from its actual or realized niche. So an example is the presence of one barnacle species limiting the realized niche of another species. So looking at here, we have different um, types of barnacles. I'm going to highlight these guys are a different species. These barnacles are a different species than the, um, bar than the barnacles here. So you have two different species of barnacles, and they live here in this intertidal zone where the tide goes in. Here's high tide, and here's low tide. And so, um, so and this is the ocean. And so you have your different species. That's these guys. So this is their realized niche. This is their actual niche, these guys here, because it's sharing space with the, these other species. Um, and this is its realized niche, the actual niche. But look at what happens um, if we take out the, the yellow ones. So the, all these are not co um, colored. So the blandness, we take those out. Look at what happens to these guys. They will overtake that niche. They will use that space where, um, so therefore their fundamental niche, what space they could potentially use is this whole big area, but they don't realistically use that because they are showing resource partitioning and sharing that space. So therefore it um, uh, decreases competition between these guys. And so this is the realized niche and so that's an example of that so as we look down below here it says the common spiny mouse and the golden spiny mouse show what are called temporal partitioning temporal is timing um, of their niches so both species are normally nocturnal or active during the night but where they coexist the golden spiny mouse becomes what we call diurnal which is active during the day, so that they can both coexist together and not um, actually dir directly compete with one another. So that's another example of kind of resource partitioning and reducing competition so that species can coexist with one another. Okay, a second type of inter um, species, interspecific interactions, we've talked about competition. And so now we're going to look at predation. So predation is a positive-negative interaction. So the predator is helped, and the prey obviously um, is the negative, 
negatively affected because it dies most of the time. One species, the predator, kills and eats the other species. So some feeding adaptations of predators are cl having claws, fangs, poison to help get their prey. So prey display various defensive adaptations to help with that. So what's a defensive adaptation? Maybe needles for plants, all right? Um, it could also be poison. So the poison dart frog is one of those um, that, that um, uh, secretes poisons. There are behavioral defenses, like forming herds or schools to make it, you, the population look bigger than it is, um, sending out alarm calls. So like the vervet monkeys that we talked about um, in chapter 52. Um, animals also have morphological, that means like the shape, the structure of it, and physiological, so that's like the inner workings inside, defense adaptations um, that I'll show you here in just a second. Um, mechanical and chemical defenses protect species such as porcupines and skunks. So skunks have a chemical defense with a odor, and porcupines have the quills. Um, so those are examples of mechanical and chemical defenses. So if you turn your page over, it gives you some examples of um, uh, these things that we just talked about with um, predators and prey um, and defenses uh, and so on. I'm going to go like this so I can show you the colored pictures. All right, so a mechanical defense is the quills of the por por uh, porcupine. Um, we're going to talk about in just a second aposmatic um, coloration where um, this would be a, um, a morphological defense um, where the coloration, um, uh, the bright colors warn other organisms that eat it once and then the bright colors warn them um, in, in general that they are poisonous. So that's the poison dark frog. We'll talk in just a minute about mimicry, um, but here's the defense with the skunk. All right, and then we'll talk about camouflage and um, the other type of mimicry. So, um, so the mechanical and chemical defenses, and then let's talk about these other types that I just threw around the names here. So animals with effective chemical defenses often exhibit the bright warning coloration, and that's aposmatic coloration. So that's up here with the poison dart frog. So let's put here example poison dart frog. <clears throat> Predators are particularly cautious in dealing with prey that display such coloration. So they're cautious about eating the poison dart frog, and so that's helpful for the defense of the poison dart frog. Some organisms, rather than being brightly colored, try to blend in with their environment. So that's the camouflage. This is called cryptic coloration. All right, which makes prey difficult to spot. In some cases, a prey species may gain significant um, protection by mimicking the appearance of another species. So there's two kinds of mimicry. So first of all, let's go back to the picture up here. So notice these two right here are defenses, mechanical and chemical. This is two different kinds of coloration. Um, the warning, the bright colored, and the cryptic coloration. Remember, let's go back up here, here at cryptic coloration. You can see right here there's a um, tree frog. And so you can see his eyes right here. These are his two legs and so on. So he blends in. And so if you didn't know he was there, um, you would never see him. And, and that's the aposmatic coloration. So now let's look at the two types of mimicry where they mimic another organism. So in Batesian mimicry, a palatable, which means that it tastes good and it's not harmful or harmless species, mimics an unpalatable or harmful. 
the harmless mimics the harmful. So that is this. All right. So, <clears throat> so this is the hawk moth, moth larva. This is non-venomous, so it's not harmful. But look at it's mimicking the um, parrot snake. It looks like the head of a snake. And so therefore, this is helpful, Batesian mimicry, because it helps the sky, because this guy is not going to be eaten because it looks like a snake, and so therefore it will ward off the predators. On the flip side, malarian mimicry, two two or more unpalatable species resemble each other. So they're both harmful. And so, so basically, that's what these two here. So the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket here, they're both um, look alike and they mimic each other. Why is that helpful? Because if something eats this or um, uh, messes with this one, it's not going to mess with this one because it looks identical and it's going to expect the same results. And so therefore they mimic each other. And so that's another type of mimicry. And so mimicry can also be used by predators. So it doesn't have to always be the prey. The example is the mimic octopus. This is so cool. Can take on the appearance and movement of more than a dozen marine animals. So it is looking for prey. It's the predator. Let me show you a picture here. So here it is mimicking a sea snake. So it looks like a snake. Here it is mimicking a flounder. And here it's mimicking a stingray. So it can change its shape um, and, and mimic the appearance of other species altogether. And so that's an example of predators using mimicry. So all of this goes underneath predation, all right? And so that is one type of interaction. Um, herbivory is another type of interaction. So this is positive negative. It refers to an interaction in which an herbivore eats part of, eats part of a plant or alga, which um, is, again, um, singular for algae. It has led to the evolution of plant mechanical and chemical defenses and adaptations by herbivores. So chemical defenses like, um, uh, you know, um, releasing poisons like poison ivy um, and the structural defenses like spines on cacti. And so that's a positive-negative interaction where the herbivore is the positive part and the negative is the plant that's being eaten. Now, some interactions undergo are on that, underneath that, that umbrella of symbiosis. So going back over here, so we've talked about predation, competition, predation, herbivory. And so now we're going to look at symbiosis. So we're going to look at these three underneath this umbrella of symbiosis. So the first one is the definition of what does in the world of symbiosis mean. It's a relationship where two or more species live in direct and intimate contact with each other. <clears throat> so, number one, so that's the big picture here. So number one, parasitism is a positive-negative interaction. One organism, the parasite, which is a disease-causing organism, derives nourishment from another organism, which is called its host. And the host is harmed in the process. So that's why it's a positive-negative. The positive, the parasite, um, uh, is benefited, and the negative is the host is harmed. So if you look at the next page here, parasites that live within the body of their hosts are called endoparasites. Endo means within. Parasites that live on the external surface of the host are ectoparasites. Many parasites have a complex lifestyle, life cycle involving a number of hosts. Some actually can, some parasites can change the behavior of the host. 
in a way that increases the likelihood that the parasite will be transmitted. So it might cause you to sneeze or something like that where it can be transmitted to the next host. So then they, um, parasites can significantly affect the survival, reproduction, and density of their host population. Because if the organisms start dying off, then the density decreases. And so that is called parasitism, right? Parasitism. Parasites live within or on their host. The second type of symbiosis where two organisms live in close relationship with one another is called mutualism. So mutualistic symbiosis, or called mutualism, is a positive-positive, all right? Or they both are positive, um, and they benefit both species. So a mutualism can be what we call obligate, where one species cannot survive without the other, and another one could be facultative, where both species can survive alone. So an example of a mutualism is with the acacia tree and these um, house stinging ants. So on the tree, this is what the tree looks like, all right? And on the tree, there are these hollow thorns. So this is the little hole here that the ants live within. And why this is a mutualistic relationship is that the ants feed off of the tree. So there's nectar um, and so on, so it feeds off the tree. So the, tree, the ants are benefited because they have a food source and a nice place to live. Now, what do the ants do for the tree to make it a mutualism? Um, the ants actually um, sting any Anything that gets close to the tree or touches the tree. So it stings it so that people, the organisms won't touch the tree. It also clips off any vegetation. Notice this whole area here where nothing is growing around it. That's because anything that tries to grow in a radius around the tree, the little ants go and clip it off and so they never are able to grow. And so therefore it helps the tree to get enough water and nutrients and things like that from the soil without any competition from surrounding plants. So pretty cool mutualism. Now it doesn't mean that that they can't live without each other, um, uh, but they they can they can survive alone, but they're better together. <clears throat> Next example is commensalism. So commensalism is a positive zero interaction, which means one species isn't affected. So one species benefits, and the other neither is neither harmed nor helped, so it doesn't either help them or harm them. Um, and it, this is really hard to document in nature because um, any close association um, most likely affects both species. And so an example of this is the cattle egret and the buffalo. All right, so the, the cattle egret are the birds, and here's the buffalo. And so um, that's one example of commensalism. So who's benefited here? The birds are benefited because as the buffalo moves through the grass, all these insects come up and the birds eat the insects. Um, and then it's said that the buffalo is neither hurt or harmed by the, the, ca the uh, cattle egrets. But uh, that's hard to prove. And so they, some people say, well, it's not really commensalism because the birds, maybe they eat ticks or things off and they help the off the buffalo, so it helps the buffalo in some way. So it's really hard to prove that really n neither uh, that the other organism really isn't hurt or harmed. So let's go back here to facilitation. The next one is plus plus or zero plus. It's an interaction in which one species has positive effects on another species without direct or intimate contact. So an example is this black rush plant, um, which makes the soil more hospitable for other plant species. Let me show you a colored picture of this. So it's these, this grass kind of stuff. It's called black rush, OK? Um, or the junkus. It's, uh, is the scientific genus name for it here. So, so we see here that with or without this, you can see that um, the area in which it lives, the salt marsh, which um, uh, 
the number of plant species is higher with this plant living there than without it. And so let's just talk about why. So let's write a couple of things. Um, this is in, in New, New England. Um, so the juncus, what does it do? Okay, it does a couple of things. It prevents salt buildup. by shading the soil surface. Reducing evaporation. Oops, all right, what does that do when it reduces evaporation? It keeps water in there and so lowers the concentration of salt. Um, so that's where I want my, lowers the salt concentration, all right, um, by increasing the water concentration, by not allowing the water to evaporate. If the water evaporated out of the soil, the soil would have a higher salt concentration because there would be no water to dilute it. Um, it also transports oxygen to below ground tissue. And so therefore, without it, the soil is saltier and there's less oxygen. Um, and so therefore, you have less species. And so even though the black rush, or the juncus plant, is not in direct contact interacting with the organisms, it's a very... Um, uh, it's facilitating the growth of a t uh, many different other plant species. So you can see when it's removed, it's you know about 50% or so less plant, um, plant species. So when removed, 50% less species supported in the area. And this is where I'll stop for the day.